So yes, hello everyone and welcome to uh, today's webinar, which is uh, on the Bonsuka production standard and particularly the health and safety indicators covered in those and the revision and the changes. So just a reminder before we get started, all the participants are muted. If you would like to make a question as we go on through uh, the webinar, you may do so using the Q&A box provided. Or alternatively, if you would like to make your comments verbally, please use the raise my hand function and we can open up your microphone. We're envisioning that today's webinar will be dynamic and involve some audience participation. So please do make any questions so we can have a more conversation style on, on what are some of the changes um, presented here today. So joining me in this webinar today is Ilana Weiss. She is a member of the Standards Revision Working Group. And as a short introduction um, to Ilana, she's the Senior Director of Health and Policy at La Isla Network. She has led and published several uh, studies investigating chronic kidney disease, uh, CKD, among sugarcane workers in Central America. Currently, Ilana is involved in the Delante Initiative, um, which is a collaboration between La Isla Network, San Antonio Sugar Mill from uh, Nicaragua, Bon Sucro and the Nic uh, Nicaraguan Sugar Producers Association. This collaboration aims to evaluate, improve, and implement evidence-based evidence occupational health, and pr uh, health protections for manual sugarcane workers. Ilana has over a decade of experience working in multi-stakeholder settings with a focus on designing uh, programs to strengthen occupational health and safety and human dignity for laborers. Her background is she has a dual master's in public health and international affairs from Columbia University. So uh, thank you and welcome Ilana. Okay, no problem. So just as a, a reminder, today's webinar is part of a, a, a series of uh, different thematic webinars that are covering all of the different changes in the Bonsucra production standard. We are entering the sixth week out of the 10th um, in this public consultation period. And so far we have uh, gone over the changes to the structure of the Bonsucra standard. We have talked about uh, human rights, um, indicators in the production standard. Today we are talking about health and safety and um, the next series of webinars will cover uh, in the environmental indicators and the production indicators. As you can see, um, all of these webinars are, will be repeating these webinars several different times in different languages and at different times to allow all of our stakeholders to have equal opportunity to attend. So if you attend the one today, you don't need to attend the following one scheduled for the rest of this week. Um, but we would like to see you again um, on the, for the webinars commencing on the 13th of July, where we'll be having some new material. So, okay, so today we'll be talking about the health and safety indicators. I would just like to go through quickly with everybody uh, what are on the left, you will see what are the indicators. And on the right in the green box, you can see some of our very quick highlights over some of the changes. The way the webinar is going to uh, work today is I'll be going through each um, indicator that will be uh, that regards health and safety. So those are mainly the ones in criteria 2.1 to provide a safe and healthy working environment in workplace operations. Now I'll be going through some of the changes and then Ilana is going to be talking to us a little bit about how um, the indicators that are covered here are used um, in her research and um, uh, and the solutions that we are proposing here. Um, and then we'll be open up for questions and we can have a little bit about a debate about some of the indicators. So the first one, uh, we're gonna, the first two that we're gonna be talking about now are the indicators 2.1.1 and 2.1.2. So uh, the first one relates to how um, health and safety risk assessment have to be conducted. And, the sec um, and this, this is an indicator that was present in the current version of the Bonsucre standard. However, we have done, uh, the, the working group has done some changes regarding what, what are the minimum contents required for these health and safety assessments. So uh, these have to cover uh, occupational uh, risks such as ergonomic work-related injury and accidents, fatigue, etc. They also cover uh, the environmental risks. So what kind of the environment can pro pose a risk to the health and safety of the workers. So here we are talking about heat stress, for example, or altitude sickness. 
And the final one, it has to cover medical uh, risks. So for example, what effect does declining kidney function in the health and safety of the workers, or if they suffer from any pre-existing uh, pre medical condition, how does, that, um, how does the work environment either hamper their ability or make their conditions worse so? So that's uh, 2.1.1. And then 2.1.2 .2 is um, you have to ensure that uh, from the risks that you have identified that you have um, plans in order to control for adequately control for these risks. What, uh, what is new in this, uh, what this indicator is we, we ask that the requirements uh, to manage those risks have to be in line with global best practice. Um, the guidance provides some examples of best practice to implement. You can either adopt the ones that we've done. We have in a number on, for example, transport, we have on heat stress, we have on, on other examples, or um, you can use your own uh, requirement. You can own use your own examples of best practice if they meet. Um, if they are, in fact, you can demonstrate that they are, in fact, supported by uh, global best practice and supported science. Good. So then the next series of indicators, um, 2.1.3 is right to water and sanitation safeguards are designed and implemented and enforced. So in comparison with the current version, the, the, the change has been that it's been, uh, we've added uh, sanitation. So when we talk about sanitation, it this refers to um, adding, so there's a requirement to have hand washing and toilet facilities in close proximity to the workstation. I think this is this indicator is quite topical, as we can see from an example of so, uh, COVID-19, the importance of sanitation for ensuring um, safety in the workplace. 2.1.4 uh, refers to uh, PPEs have to be used. Um, it used to be a non-core indicator, but it's now been moved to a core indicator. Uh, 2.1.5 percentage of staff trained uh, health and safety at the start and at least every year. And uh, before the current indicator used to say that you have to have the retraining every uh, minimum, every uh, maximum, every five years. Now we said every year you have to have an update to the health uh, uh, to the to the retraining. So workers have to have an either an update when they uh, every year or they have to be retrained in in, in some capacity. Finally, lost time accident frequency. Uh, so here are uh, the current indicate the current standard asks for a series of metrics of uh, the maximum accident rate per million hour worked. That could be so. This is 15 hours, um, less than 15 accidents per million hours worked um, at the mill level, and 45. Uh, accidents per million hours worked from the farm, in the farm area. So this has been changed uh, from 45 to 30 in the farm area. Um, and then the, the next indicator is there hasn't been any change, which is all workers have access to first aid and emergency response. And the, the last indicator that we're going to be covering today is adequate accommodation is provided. So this is a new um, indicator that wasn't covered. This topic wasn't covered in the pre in this current version of the standard. And what we refer to adequate accommodation is, is required. We are talking about all of the workers um, who either who conduct activities in the mill or the, in the unit or on the farm side of the unit or certification for whom housing is provided to them directly by either the mill, for example, or the farmers included in those. The minimum housing requirements must meet local regulatory standards um, and in the, uh, or, the stand, or, or the minimum guidance stated in the guidance and the draft standard that you will see, whichever is more stringent. Um, Yes. So first of all, we'd like to ask, are these requirements clear? Do you want me to explain a little bit more um, about what other changes, maybe explain some of the rationales as well? I'll open up to questions. No, there's no questions coming in. Yes, there is a question. In 2.1.5, does Bonsucre specify the health and safety topics to be covered by the annual training? 
So if we go back to 2.5 is we have to have a health and safety at the start in every five years. No, we just say that uh, the, the, the health and safety, that they have to be trained according to the health and safety needs, according to each of their functions that they're going to, to, to be able to, to do their role safely. The trainings are going to differ from function to function. Some might need more. For example, security guard will require a different type of, of safety than an operator, uh, like a boiler operator, for example. So we don't set which ones, but it's just uh, pertinent to each and everyone's role. Thank you, Livia, for that question. Then the next question is, uh, Karin. Hi, could you please tell us more about the reason to reducing the indicator and accident rate from Karin? Yes, of course we can. So, uh, uh, Bon Sucro has, uh, through the Bon Sucro calculator, uh, we can uh, evaluate actual performance of how they've been performing against the, uh, the previous uh, been performing on the metrics. And we actually found that uh, the, the, the majority of the mills of the certified are having accidents rates which are quite below the 45 um, accidents per million hours worked in the farm level. Therefore, it was deemed to, to it's warranted to reduce it just to make the standard um, more stringent, but it is reflecting as well the actual practices of the certified operators. Thank you very much, Karine, for that question. There is another question from Ritu. Does accommodation apply for contractual workers at the mill and at the farm? It, re it applies to all workers who are undertaking activities in the, uh, in the unit of certification for whom housing is provided. So if, the, for example, the mill or the farmer directly provides accommodation to those workers, regardless of their contractual status, then they do have to meet those uh, minimum uh, housing requirements. If uh, the workers have to find their own accommodation, it is not covered in this uh, indicator. However, there, are, uh, in, there is an indicator in principle five, which is a continuous improvement indicators that uh, mention the responsibility of the operators to ensure continuously improve the housing and sanitary conditions of the, uh, of the workers uh, uh, not included in the, not provided directly the housing for it. 2.1.3 provide safe and clean drinking water is a must. Of course, that is a um, that is a core requirement. Elan, I'm sure, can enlighten us a little bit about exactly more about the importance of not only um, providing clean drinking water, but the amount of, uh, of of drinking water, how important that is, and what else supplemented uh, the water. This has all been. Um, this has also been uh, incorporated. There's also another, another question from Anthony is, uh, how has the response been to the provision of sanitation being particularly from labor intensive operations? So at the mo uh, response you mean to, to the inclusion in this, in this standard? Um, well, well, we'll be waiting to see the conclusion of this public consultation period to be able to, um, uh, to, to, to analyze all of the, all of the comments that receive in this, in this particular time. Thank you. I think we've covered all of the other questions. If anyone wants to also uh, raise a hand or not, I don't know if I want to ask, um, if I want to call in Il uh, Ilana, if she wants to make any, any comments or, or questions about how holistically these changes have been, are, are seen to, um, what has been the rationale and some of the motivation for these changes? Hi, um, I think I think you did a really great summary, Noel. I am happy to to jump in if anybody has a specific question about these changes. Otherwise, maybe I can yeah. address it more clearly with the with the presentation we put together. No. Okay, that, that, that's fine. If there are no other questions, I think we can move on to the next uh, topic. What? Um, so, uh, as a reminder, you know, on the health and safety risk assessment, these new requirements, you know, covering occupational risk, environmental risk, and uh, medical risks, and then having global best practice um, in order to control for these risks. So, um, I wanted to, to introduce Ilana uh, here that's going to give us an overview of how we have seen through experience, through working in these different programs, how all of these three 
elements involved in the health and safety plan and how can they lead to designing a um, you know, global best practice in regards to, to, to maximizing the health um, of the workers. Um, we're go it's going to be, here we're going to be focusing on uh, heat stress, which is a particular uh, concern in, in, the sugar, in the sugar industry, but it's also just to provide us a context of how in practice um, what, what is written in the standards, how that, does that translate to actual real world environment. So, Ilana, I would like to hand over uh, to you. However, there is, uh, yes, uh, okay, so there's no more questions. So, Ilana, can you just confirm that you can uh, see your, the next, your screen? Yes, can you see it? Yes, I can, I can see it. Okay, if you can just, if you just let me know when you want me to, to change the slides. Sure. I'll turn my video on so I can talk to you as well. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, as, as Noel said, looking within the context of, of principle to um, looking at the health and safety assessment through the lens of occupational environmental risk and pre-existing medical conditions, um, heat stress, um, is a really is a really good example of one that we can give you that um, touches upon all of those and then provides a very clear prescriptive um, mitigation technique for intervention programs um, that would help with compliance in 2.1.2, which was um, implemented and enforced plans. So, in I think it also is in, especially important now to talk about in the context of the coronavirus epidemic. Um, because it also touches upon um, heat stress protections because um, a lot of the PPE that we've been hearing about um, that are necessary to protect people from infection also will have an impact on the body's thermoregulation system. So, um, you know, looking at occupational risk, which is exposure to, to heat stress and and heavy labor, looking at the environmental risk, which is again high heat, um, and then looking at pre-existing medical conditions, which in this case can be um, decreased kidney function or a prolonged high fever due to infectious disease. Um, okay, now next slide please. So this is just a heat map that I pulled from the internet. It's um, maybe not the best one, but it illustrates why this is important and relevant for the sugar sector. Um, most of the world's sugar is produced in that equatorial band between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, where you see those very high temperatures. This is you know, an average global temperature, so it's not capturing hot days that are less prolonged. So even if your country um, is showing up as orange or yellow, it does not preclude that there will be extended periods of hot days that are over thresholds where we need to protect outdoor workers or indoor factory workers that are exposed to high heat. Um, again, this is not exclusive to the sugar sector. Protection against heat stress is something that will affect all industries that have outdoor workers across the agricultural sector, construction, mining, um, but just an important reminder that um, it's hot and, and it's getting hotter. So this is relevant for us as we're thinking about um, health and safety protections and, and sustainability. All right, next slide, please, Noel. So, um, why, what is dangerous about heat stress? Oh, thank you. Um, there, are, there are two kinds of, of heat stress exposures. One is just being in a hot environment. Um, there are places in the Middle East, for example, where it can get up to 50 degrees Celsius and it is dangerous for, the human, for humans to just sit outside, even if you're not doing any work 
Um, if you just sit outside in the shade, um, high temperatures can overwhelm the, the human body's coping mechanisms. But what we're interested in that, but we are also interested in the sugarcane context, in the context of manual labor, um, something called exertional heat, um, heat stress. So that is um, the, the, when you're, the energy that it takes for your body to work very hard raises your temper, your, the body of your, the temperature of your body and can cause organ failure um, and, and death. Also in kind of in, in other outcomes, or as it says on the slide is, it can lead to lower productivity and increased accidents. Um, again, this is well documented in the sugarcane context, but it also appears um, in literature looking at sports medicine, military operations, and across, um, across industrial sectors. All right, go ahead, Noel. Um, so more and more evidence is being generated. This is just publications. Most of these are from the last um, seven or eight months that's looking specifically at kidney disease in the sugarcane context in Central America. So it is a direct link to working conditions and kidney disease. Um, there, um, again, it's not limited to the sugarcane sector, but um, it is relevant for the sugarcane sector as these publications show. And um, if there are operations that have manual cane cutting or manual seat cutting, it's especially important to pay attention. Thanks. Well, next one. So what's the physiology behind heat stress? This is not the prettiest slide, but I just wanted to show kind of the different um, components of what overwhelms the, the human body's uh, thermoregulation process. Humans are not particularly good at, at cooling ourselves down. We're much better at heating ourselves up. Um, so you have the different kinds of um, solar radiations and air temperature, humidity, wind speed, um, plus, um, you know, what, what do we do as humans to, to cool ourselves down? We perspire, we breathe quickly, we, um, our, our veins dilate so that our blood is closer to the surface so that there, if there is any wind, um, it can cool our, our skin. But, um, Again, just kind of hitting home that the, the combination of environmental heat and internal heat produced by heavy workloads um, is dangerous and can, and can lead to heat stress, which has a whole broad spectrum of, of outcomes. The most dangerous is, is heat stroke, which can lead to death. It can lead to death, a slower death through chronic, chronic kidney damage or, or other sorts of organ failure. And... Um, Pertinently, and I'm repeating myself now, I know, yeah, increased accident uh, risk and reduced productivity in the fields. So go ahead, Noel, to the next one. So this is a, a more simple way to break it down. Um, the external factors that lead to heat stress is the, the temperature and um, the first two points kind of are the, the, the way that you measure the real feel of temperature. So when you hear a weather report and it says it's um, you know 80 degrees outside, but it feels like 88, this is what we mean by um, you know, the temperature, the wind speed, and the relative humidity. Heavy workload and piece rate is a big contributing factor to exertional heat stress. Um, we People are really good at, at self-regulating. We know when we're working too hard and when we're going to overheat but we are also really good at overriding those systems. So when peace rates are involved or, um, and, and work quotas, we are um, kind of incentivized to over, the, the workers are incentivized to overexert themselves. And I'll show you a slide a little bit later that illustrates that, that peace work can really drive people to work, workers to work too hard um, and put themselves in danger for different heat stress. Clothing is an important protector, but it can also exa exacerbate heat stress. So the right clothing will help moisture wick and will protect you from solar radiation, but the wrong clothing will actually impede the body's natural um, defenses against 
overheating. So it will impede um, sweating and, and evaporation. Uh, next one, Noah. These are some of the internal factors that would lead to, to heat stress. Um, dehydration, which Noel spoke about earlier, in order for your body to thermoregulate and to function well, you need to be hydrated. If you are working hard in high heat, you are losing a lot of liquid and you are losing a lot of electrolytes. So that's an important factor. The metabolic load, which is just the amount of energy that's required to complete a task. Um, there are differences based on, on gender that can cause, um, that can get, that can lead to different levels of, of heat stress. Men, um, tend to run hotter. They, they have bigger muscles, um, and use more energy though. Um, you know, women also, if they're, if they're pregnant, if they are where they are in their menstrual cycle also determines what their internal body temperature is. And then health conditions and fever are really important and very important again in the context of coronavirus. If your body, if you are starting already hot, your body is um, trying to get your fever down. So already engaging different sorts of physiological mechanisms to get your body temperature um, down. So if your body, if your body is starting hot, then you're exposed to the sun and then you're working hard. Um, you are at extremely higher risk for a heat stress event um, or um, incident kidney injury, which could lead to uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, we can talk a little more about that later as well. Um, okay, now the next one. So this is pulled from our research in Nicaragua. We just kind of, I wanted to show you how hard these sugarcane workers are, are actually working compared to some other activities. Um, the, the sports medicine physiologists who pulled these, um, these other, the, the comparative groups looking through the literature tried to find something um, comparable to the exertion, the daily exertion of a sugarcane worker. So here you have um, military operations, which are multi-day training exercises generally for the U.S. Army. Um, the U.S. has a tendency to fight wars in hot deserts, so heat stress and um, protecting soldiers from the effects of heat stress has been a, a, a major research priority for them. Um, marathon races, I think everybody knows what a marathon is, and then ultra endurance racing, which is multi-day marathon races in extreme conditions. So these are, you know, four day runs through the Sahara Desert or running through mountain ranges. Um, it's, an, it's an extreme sport. And as you can see, sugarcane workers are, um, are, right, are right up there. An important uh, observation here is that in the case of these other groups, they're, they're not really sustained um, activities. So the multi-day military training operations are maximum six days, once a year, maybe. Um, marathon race, people will do one in a lifetime or um, perhaps one a year or, or two a year max. Um, and then ultra endurance racing the same. It could be once in a lifetime or perhaps once a year. And both the other three are, you know, self-paced, not sustained with ample recovery time and ample nutrition before, during, and after these massive exertions in energy. Um, sugarcane workers are working six days a week for five to six months. Um, this was taken in Nicaragua where the workday ends at noon. So they're working approximately five and a half hour days, but there are a lot of manual laborers in, in the sugarcane sector that are working three, four, five o'clock in the afternoon. So much longer days um, where we would anticipate sustained um, heart rates that are pretty high. Okay, Noel, you can go to the next one. So this is another way to look at the graph. Um, so the last, the last slide was kind of the, the average maximum heart rate. And here you can see what an actual day looks like for 20 sugarcane workers in, in Nicaragua. Um, I know that you're all muted, but 
Does anybody have any guesses as to as to what those dips are on the on the hour? Well, since you can't talk, I will answer. Those the rest are period. That's right. Those are the rest periods, and so you can see what an effective what an effective strategy it is to have regular rests to help people get their heart rates down. So when the heart rate goes down, the, the body temperature goes down. Um, and they're also important moments for people to hydrate. Um, if these guys didn't have rests, actually you can go to the next slide, Noah. So this is again overlaying the, the, the comparator groups with the sugar cane cutters. So if these guys didn't have a rest and they just worked through the whole day, they may self-pace a little bit differently, but it's safe to assume that they would, over the course of their work, they maintain a heart rate similar to ultra endurance marathon runners, um, which is, it's just extreme. Um, I also wanted to point out on this graph something really interesting, which is the major acceleration from kind of standing heart rate to working really hard right away. They just kind of spike right up there right in the beginning of the day. So even implementing breaks in the early hours of the day is, um, is really essential for making sure that people keep their core body temperature down over the course of the day. And the other thing I wanted to point out was what's happening at kind of the 12 p.m. mark. So at Ingenio San Antonio, um, they have very strict rules about coming out of the sugar fields at noon. And you can see, so the, 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 dark, the dark line is the average, and then the kind of whisker gray lines are individuals. And you can see at the end of the day, there's a couple guys who are really working hard. They, their heart rates are going all the way up to 90% max, which is incredible. Um, and I, as I was talking about before, the importance of peace rate, I think that these guys are either trying to finish their quota for the day or trying to guess, make a little bit more um, money, you know, get, get that, that extra, at that extra um, ton, finish that extra ton for the end of the day to get an extra dollar or two. Um, and so that's what I mean about overriding your body, um, telling you that it's hot and you're tired is just making that big force to, to finish your day um, and what's required, what's asked of you by your, by your supervisors. Um, okay, next one, Noel. So now um, I've mentioned, and, and Noel mentioned a little bit about the intervention that way you can do to prevent Kind of heat stress and, and the research that we've been doing is specifically looking at one effect of heat stress, which is chronic kidney disease. Um, what's missing from this graph and, and from the presentation is a, is a talk about acclimatization, um, but that's another mitigation strategy um, for workers that are going into hard work in hot environments that there needs to be um, a, a period of time where they're getting used to it. Otherwise they're at higher risk for heat stress events. So our, our water rest shade, program is just taking um, the basic concepts of um, OSHA programs and designing them specifically for a sugarcane context. So we can dive right in um, and well I guess it's important also to talk about the importance of having um, of having all of the components and um, having a good implementation. It's not good enough to just check things off the list. If this isn't done right, then they, it's a useless intervention. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, uh, as we go along. But go ahead, Noel, thank you. So this was kind of one of the, the recommended breaks that we developed for three different kinds of work, sugar cane cutters, seed cutters, and, and other kinds of field work. Um, it is based on hourly breaks, which you saw very clearly in the heart rate monitoring. Um, and it, this was created with input from um, mill staff and from the workers themselves. Um, for example, in the last one, other field work, we had implemented a short break early in the morning for, for those folks. But I think that our recommendation this year was that that break 
can be optional because they're they're not working so hard as these other two groups. Their their blood their body temperatures their their sorry their heart rates are not soaring early in the morning, and it's actually more important for them to advance in the cooler hours of the day. So this is something that is data driven and evidence based that we are adapting based on the realities of sugarcane context, um, depending on where sugarcane is produced, what, where your country is, what the work days are like, this can vary, but this is just a, an example of, of what that would look like. Um, rest also needs to be in the shade and it needs to be close to where the workers are working. So it can be natural shade or it can be a shade tent, but if you have these rest breaks that are, that are not that long and you're having people walk several hundred meters in order to take them, it kind of undoes the benefit of having rest breaks to begin with. So this is what I mean by well-implemented, well-thought-out interventions. I'll go ahead to the next one, Noel. Um, we did research over the course of three years and changed our um, rest schedule suggestions based on what we saw. So you can see how they've changed over the last couple of years. And I, I included this slide because I wanted to point out the columns all the way to the right. So despite increased hours of rest over the well, increased time of rest over the last uh, over the last three years, productivity actually increased. And in the far right, kidney disease and incident kidney injury decreased significantly. So just the, highlighting that if you do this correctly, if this is well implemented, it does have a, a positive impact for production and a positive impact for worker health. Okay, go ahead, Noah. This is an alternative rest schedule. This comes from, it's kind of a conglomeration of OSHA and NIOSH. Um, they're very similar. Um, in the standard, we give you the option to use a rest schedule that we recommended, which is what I just showed you. If sugar production is happening in a country that has heat stress parameters in labor law, this is what they're using. If company policy around heat stress and occupational health quotes NIOSH or OSHA, or this, this is, this is the, the, the rest schedule that, that is being used. It is nearly impossible to implement in the sugarcane context, and I'll explain why. Um, that middle blue line is average temperature over the course of um, an entire harvest season. And the dotted gray lines up above are kind of the 90% range of highest temperatures and lowest temperatures. Um, the little red circles show that when it gets to be a particular temperature for the wet bulb global temperature, which is one of the, the heat index measurements that I was talking about earlier, that's those little red circles indicate how much rest you need when it gets to those temperatures. So in Central America, by um, seven o'clock in the morning at some cases and nine o'clock, like you're already having to rest 30 minutes out of an hour. There are some cases that by nine o'clock in the morning, all work needs to cease. If you go up to that top dotted line, yeah, right there, where it, where it crosses that 60 minute rest per hour mark, um, that's, all work must cease by nine o'clock in the morning, which is not, pra not practical. Um, so I just wanted to point this out because th this is the gold standard for heat stress prevention, but it, it does add a burden for producers because it requires them to then be measuring temperatures at least hourly, but probably every half hour. And um, stopping, stopping work sometimes early in the morning if temperatures get too hot. So um, we think that the, the alternative rest schedule that we um, presented is effective in protecting worker health and is a much more manageable alternative than um, this gold standard that is hard to achieve. All right, Noel, go ahead. So this is an example of how shade tents need to, you know, it's not good enough to just throw whatever tent out there. 
there needs to be enough room for people inside. There should be water in there so people can refill. It's a really important opportunity to hydrate. Um, we, we really are strong advocates of seated rest because it allows, it really allows um, heart rate to go down and, and muscles to relax. Um, there needs to be at least three walls of the tent. So a roof and two sides to adequately block the sun. It should be portable and movable so that you can um, move it as, as the workers advance in the field because they don't stay in the same spot all day. Um, and then it needs to be high enough so that, and, and it needs to be high enough so that there's some wind current that can go by so you're not creating a hot box instead of a, a shade tent. Okay, go ahead, Noah. Then hydration. Um, we're recommending hydration beverages to replace some of the electrolytes lost, but primarily we are, um, it's important to have clean, fresh water. And that the water needs to be at least at um, a palatable temperature. Drinking cold water is a really great way to cool, um, to cool yourself down. So having water sitting outside in the sun in a plastic container or a metal container, that's, that's really hot. It's water. It'll, it'll, it'll hydrate you, but it, um, workers are less likely to drink it and it won't have that added benefit of cooling the body down. So this is just um, an example of recommended um, hydration over, depending on how, on how hot it is. For sugar cane cutters who are working quite hard, it's, it's about a liter per hour of, of water. Okay, go ahead, Noelle. And again, just emphasizing the importance of having well-implemented interventions. Um, if you have all of the components of the interventions, but they are substandard, it is equivalent to not having an intervention. So um, we are hoping to provide really good guidance in this component of the Bonsucro standard to help, um, help producers um, implement these really basic heat stress prevention in, in, their, um, in their fields and to be available to answer any question. And if you are part of a, um, a production unit that you don't think that you have this problem, then we can also give you tools to measure to make sure that you don't have it. So last slide is just my thank you. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to explain it to you. Th thank you very much, Ilana. Uh, that was great because, as I said, it's, I think it's a great example of what are some of the interventions that we are talking about of what are in, in requiring in some of the, the new standard requirements on the risk assessment intervention. For example, as a summary, you know, here we have uh, the occupational, if we look at the occupational ex um, components of it, we have the effort, ex uh, the effort needed to undertake work. So we can see here how it's been adopted, the, the rest schedule and the work schedule for cane cutters, for seed, for other types of agriculture. So that changes. How does the environmental affect the health and safety? So here we're talking about not only the heat, but the humidity, uh, et cetera. And uh, then the, how do pre-existing conditions also affect these? So for example, how if you already have a fever and already a high temperature, how does that affect you? Or for example, if you have other um, pre-existing conditions, for example, I don't know, let's say even uh, pregnancies, how does that affect it as well? So I think it's a good way of capturing of what, what are some, when we term um, um, best practice implemented, that is backed up by science and, and evidence based to really tackle the root of the issues. Um, just to clarify, this is just one example of one of the risks. You know, this will this sort of model should apply to any major uh, health and safety risk which are apart from heat stress. Um, and this is just one recommendation based in the standard. You know, it will depend upon if uh, not every region will, will We'll cover it. For example, we saw here, you know, in, in certain in certain areas, the heat the heat risk will be lower or higher. So with that, thank you very much. I just wanted to open up uh, for questions to see if anybody had any questions or comments. Um, I would like if anybody would like to raise their hand and make maybe verbally some of their questions. I think it would be a nice complement to the session. No, no questions. Uh, Yet.
No. Good. Let me just bring up the other slides then. All right, I think Ilona, you did a great job because there is no uh, no no questions uh, on this um, or any comments uh, in that sense. So um, I just wanted to to maybe uh, highlight, maybe go back. Um, uh, there is some questions regarding uh, regarding if the medical checkups have to be free of charge. Um, at the um, Ilana, do you have any comments regarding to this on the requirements on the standard? Um, no, in the in the in the standard, we didn't specifically say it, but just um, knowing who the population is, who is is working in the fields, um, I think it's more most reasonable to provide it free of charge. Again, yeah, and, and it's also is to see if, of how the implementation works. If you have to, if you, if it's a requirement that you have to have this health and safety, um, uh, sorry, these medical pre-screenings if they're a requirement for your health and safety system and you're not providing it for free, you have to ensure that all the workers are in fact um, receiving it. So it's a question of implementation. If it can be, if it's fine to, to an external company to provide it or if the workers um, have to do it themselves, just ensure that it's the most effective way and efficient way and that everyone is in fact uh, taking it taking these medical pre-screenings. Okay, so we have uh, an extra 10 minutes if anybody uh, has any questions, uh, not only maybe not only regarding these, but also some of the other requirements. Maybe we can talk a little bit about accommodation. Uh, what are the expectations around there? All right, doesn't seem so. Great, so um, as a summary, you know, we're on the middle of the standard uh, revision consultation process. All of the, the, the indicators that we talked about form part of the first draft. We are, you know, actively seeking comments from all of you as what you think this is achievable, what is lacking, what needs to be reviewed because maybe it's not workable in a setting or not. So these comments are really, really helpful for us. Um, you can find the draft standard, the summary of changes and the, uh, and the form to, to fill out your comments on the Bon Sucre website. Um, you can fill them up and send them back to Bon Sucre, everyone else at Bon Sucre. Sarah uh, asked if uh, the deck can be circulated. Yes, we can circulate this at the conclusion of it. No problem, Sarah. So, um, yeah, so you can fill out uh, the comments, send it back to Bon Sucre. If you have any questions as well, you can contact myself. And if you want to contact some of the standard revision working group, I can act as a nexus. Uh, no problem in that. Um, we are doing a number of series of different webinars. Uh, on the different elements of the Bon Sucre production standard. Uh, old recordings are available online if you missed. If you missed some of them, you would like to revisit them. Um, and the next one we hope to see you is on the environmental uh, indicators talking about the 13th of July. Here we're going to be talking about things like deforestation, about water, we're going to be talking about uh, soil health, some of the production indicators as well. So it promises to be quite an interesting set of, of discussions. Um, with that, if anybody else has any no, no questions coming along, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, great. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. And I uh, hope you have a nice day. I'll be, staying, uh, I'll be staying on if anybody wants to talk more privately after the session. Uh, and if not, we'll hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>